I'm Alan Mortis, and this is Think Radio Presents Think Planet. My guest today is journalist and Master of Environmental Management candidate Sam Liebel. Basically, for as long as we have had cattle grazing in the West, we have had cheatgrass out here. And um, this sort of makes sense. Cheatgrass is from that same part, kind of middle of Eurasia out there where we domesticated our sheep, our goats. It's in, it's, it's just followed them, really. Um, it's, it's, it's just kind of part of this culture of, of grazing that we have. Welcome to another great conversation on Think Radio. Think Planet is made possible by support from the Western Colorado University School of Environment and Sustainability, empowering future change agents to foster ecologically resilient, economically sustainable, and socially just communities throughout the world. If you like Think Planet, then I know you'll enjoy the other shows in the Think Radio Presents family of podcasts. Think People, a celebration of just how amazing people can be. Think Business, a weekly discussion with entrepreneurs, innovators, and disruptors on sustainable business into the 21st century. Subscribe to Think Radio Presents on iTunes, YouTube, or wherever else you get great content. And don't forget to help us spread the word by liking our social media channels and sharing the content we post. We're grateful to have you in the conversation on Think Radio Presents. My guest today is journalist and Master of Environmental Management candidate Sam Liebel. Liebel has written for publications in Washington State, Texas, and Colorado. He grew up in the Houston area, where he cut his teeth as a journalist covering the social and environmental impacts of large oil refineries. That experience gave him an insider's perspective that many environmental journalists lack. Since coming to Colorado, he's turned his attention to public lands management and is currently pursuing a long-term project researching the effects of invasive species in the Mountain West, particularly something called cheatgrass, which we're going to talk about today. Sam, thanks for joining me. Thanks for having me here, Alan. I'm, I'm fascinated by this idea of a kid who grew up in the oil patch down around Houston winding up in Colorado. What's your story? Tell us about what it's like to live in the shadow of these refineries and then find yourself here. Um, Yeah, so I grew up north of Houston um, in a suburb called the Woodlands. Um, It used to be kind of a a small spot, and my parents moved there when it was just starting to develop. Um, But um, it's it's grown into something that's that's quite large now, and I can tell people the suburb I'm from, and they know about it. Well, everything's big in Houston. Yeah, this is an especially interesting suburb. Um, it's it's a very affluent, uh, master planned community where um, everyone's mom or dad or sometimes both worked for big oil companies. Um, and even if, like, let's say uh, your family member was a doctor in the town, well, that doctor, you know, that hospital is probably still funded in part by oil companies. And, and really, this is the story of the, the entire greater Houston area. Um, mm-hmm. Everyone's tied to oil. Even if you don't work directly in, in, the, um, in the oil industry, it's pretty clear to, uh, to make a connection between yep. whatever niche of the economy that you have and the oil industry. It's really what, what makes it tick down there. And um, in a lot of ways, just because we live in a fossil fuel-based economy, Houston feels like the, the center of the world. A lot. It feels like it's the most important city in the world because well, yeah. that's where the major energy companies are based. So, um, yeah, I grew up where my family, um, my my friends' parents, and and now a lot of the people that I grew up with uh, work for oil companies. So um, it's it's I've never been in the situation where I can think, oh, those are you know, bad people, evil people, people who wake up in the morning wanting to to harm the planet. Um, I've always known kind of the personal stories. They were your friends and neighbors. Yeah, and and kind of known that they just want what's best for their families, and they wake up in the morning just wanting to do good, to do the best for themselves and their families. Well, that sounds remarkably middle of the road these days when uh, everybody's staked out the fringes. How was, how did your experience as a journalist working in that environment sort of continue to shape that idea that, wait a minute, we're not talking about an evil empire here. We're just talking about people doing what they do. Yeah. 
So um, I started working for newspapers when I was in college. I put that aside and taught survival skills and outdoor education for a couple years after college. I basically came out of my undergrad thinking, I don't really know how to live on this planet. And I wanted to figure that out. And mm -hmm. so I kind of went back to the, the Stone Age skills, the very basic things that make us human. And then I got kind of bored. And I knew that I really enjoyed writing. And I thought, I need to make a go of. What was boring about that? Um, because it sounds so fascinating. <laughs> yeah, I mean, because I mean, you're, it is, you're it an is expert after in these things. You can teach people how to, yeah. how to you know, tan hides and yeah. and survive in the, in the woods. Why, why did you find that boring as opposed to what you're doing now? Um, I felt a little bit like I had my head down in the sand, mm -hmm. and I needed to. I was ready to, to come back up and take a big breath of the the world as it is possibly now because and how complicated it is. We don't live is. in the Stone Age anymore. So <laughs> yeah, yeah. Don't. I mean, I think that stuff's it is very useful and I came away with the perspective that um, that is is within our reach all those skills the self-reliance that sort of thing um, is it actually you know if if our economy somehow fell apart and we needed to rely um, less on fossil fuels for our energy sources I feel like we could actually revert to those skills very fast what I found was that those, those skills like making friction fire, making clothes out of animal skins are actually really pretty easy skills to reacquire, even <laughs> for people who grew up in a wow. suburb like me. But anyhow, so I, I, you know, I did this for a while. I um, became a bit of an expert in a few skills, but I, I felt like I needed to, um, but that I wasn't using all, all my gifts. And mm -hmm. I felt like I needed to um, kind of process the world as a writer and make a go of it. So I worked in Salida for the Mountain Mail, a daily newspaper for about a year. And then an opportunity came out to work for a daily newspaper um, in Brazoria County, Texas, which was one of the counties hit hardest by Hurricane Harvey. And it's also the location of the second largest petrochemical manufacturing complex in the world. Oh. So where we went from Salida, beautiful clear skies and mountain air <laughs> to of Colorado to living um, next to uh, a 10 lane highway where we can never really see the stars at night because there were so many flares. And um, I felt after um, I worked down in Brazoria County, I felt like I understood where I came from, Texas, mm. Um, mm. more than I ever had before. I felt like I understood the South. I felt like I understood um, kind of mainstream American values, how people structure their lives, how they accept and also deny the impacts that they're having in the world. Well, um, why? What, what was it about that experience that led you to be able to say that right now? Um, what things didn't you know, having grown up down there, yeah. that you did after working as a journalist? I, I grew up in in a town where everyone was a manager. And, you know, maybe they'd done a stint out in Midland or North Dakota for a bit, but then they got uh -huh. to go have their desk job in Houston. Um, so, and I was then living in a place where there was no separation between people and the actual, the stuff, the oil and all the other um, kind of petrochemical stuff that was going on down there. So it was uh, this direct connection there. And you could, I mean, I, I knew which way the wind was blowing every day um, based, <laughs> on oh, how yeah. it, based on how it smelled. How it smelled, sure. Yeah. Um, and uh, I, I surfed a lot down there. So I was surfing in waters that were uh, is in the delta of the Brazos River, one of the largest watersheds in Texas, and the watershed that picks up all the well stuff. Well aware of Well aware of it. Water. And I was surfing next to people who, you know, we'd be out in the water sitting on our boards waiting for the next set to come in, and they would point to this tower, that flare over there, and say, I built that. I'm the engineer who worked on that for years, and I'm really proud of it. Let me tell you about it. And Wow. Yeah. And this, is, this is not hypothetical anymore at all. No, no, yeah. yeah. Well, and so when you say you understood Texas values, Southern values, and fundamental American values, point to a couple of those things that you said, oh, aha. Um, it really hit home for me, this um, historic um, African-American church in uh, outside of a small town called Sweeney, Texas, um, and Sweeney is named Sweeney, Texas, because it's the former site of the, the Sweeney Plantation. And mm -hmm. a lot of the people who live there um, are the descendants of black slaves who were freed at the plantation. I mean, I was talking to people and they would they you know pointed out to me where 
the the you know extremely large live oak tree was where people learned that they'd been emancipated um mm. and that town um was very agricultural i talked to people who um were about the same age as my parents who remember growing up picking cotton um and that town really embraced um oil refineries as its new economic base. Mm -hmm. And it, it really brought the town up. It is still a company town. Um, but what the, the oil refinery there, in particular one owned by Chevron Phillips, um, did was that they blocked off one of the bayous that led into their industrial zone. And as a result, they backed up the floodwaters of Hurricane Harvey um, up a bayou. That um, the water could no longer get to the sea. The water can no longer get to the sea, and it's so flat there, and it backed up and it inundated um, a neighborhood that was black and poor in this church that had been there since uh, the slaves were freed. And um, it. And you were covering this for the newspaper. I was covering this for the newspaper. I knew that the white county commissioners had been out there and they had seen the shipping containers that were put in the bayou to block it off and they did nothing about it. I knew that um, the pastor at the church, as much as he wanted help, was also an uh, employee of the refinery and mm. so didn't really <laughs> want to join a lawsuit. Mm -hmm. I profiled a man who became the lead plaintiff on a class action lawsuit um, because his property was flooded, but he was he was a retired worker at that refinery, and so he actually, as soon as my story came out about all this, he backed away and said, no, I had nothing to do with this. I don't want to file a lawsuit at all. Um, so this really complex mixture of the legacy of slavery, continuing racism, industry, and poor people just wanting to get ahead, and that is a, a big part of the story of the ongoing economic boom because of cheap natural gas um, that the Texas Gulf Coast is now seeing. There's a lot of people coming in to be to be welders, to be pipe fitters, sure, um, to be day laborers, and they're getting really well paid, and um, they're having a kind of economic, kind of once in a lifetime economic chance to really make a bunch of money and do better for their families, hmm. um, which is not an opportunity that ever existed when the plantation was there. Right. So you yeah. could you could say we we tend to look at things like refineries now. If you look at it from an environmental perspective and you think, oh, my gosh, this is terrible. That's a horrible thing on the landscape there, a horrible impact um, to the environment and, and even to society in some ways. But when you put that in a broader perspective, well, maybe not. It's not that it's not that it's something um, that just appeared out of nowhere. It replaced something that was even worse. Would you agree with that? No, I don't know if it's even worse. Um, it, uh, I mean, in terms of an environmental impact. Well, I don't know. It was it was cattle ranching and it was cotton farming down there. I know, but if I can be a welder now and be really well paid for it, that's a that's a sought after skill. Yeah, yeah. Historically, I'm, that sort of opportunity was not available to me. So it's at least right. a step in that direction. Right, right. A lot of people are getting ahead. Well, we've yeah. got a lot of work to do, no doubt. Don't yeah. misunderstand me. Yeah. But I find it interesting that when you broaden your perspective out a little bit there's a there's an arrow of progress here that if we just keep working it you know yeah. we are we are at least moving in the in the direction of of economic prosperity yeah maybe in the short term yeah <laughs> <laughs> well no because it's a boom and bust sort of industry absolutely and and those the industrial players down there have a history of basically ramping up production to the point where they're um, prices collapse, and so we that was that's perhaps on the horizon down there. And yeah, I mean, already they were starting to lay off a lot of people. Um, it would be nice to think we were learning something about that, but maybe not. Yeah, and you know, in Texas, they're going to be the last people to ever learn that lesson because that idea of thinking about the long term, of thinking about um, kind of collective action and our collective well-being, is not a Texas value. No, it's a ever. Every person for themselves sort of uh, pioneer ethic that still lives down there. And listen, I can speak. Yeah. I can speak because I am a Texan. I did come from from South Texas. I didn't yeah. live in the in the refinery neighborhood, but um, grew up around agriculture and around that sort of mindset that yeah. made Texas what it is. Yeah. Sort of the we conquered this place. Um, and, Absolutely. And, yeah. And, 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 and we it did goes it. back to the earliest history of Texas. Yeah. Yeah. Interesting. 
that those kinds of mindsets still exist. They still drive decisions today. We, we like to think that we've moved past all of that, but but in fact we haven't. And we're not picking on the Texans. I mean, that could be said of <laughs> no, in Ohio. I, it, and, you know, it's, it's almost like Texans are um, kind of hyper-Americans in that way, that this ethos of I'm going to do what's best for me, this uh, individualism is definitely an American trait, Mm-hmm. I think Texans mm-hmm. take it to another level. Mm-hmm. They always have. Yeah. And, uh, well, they kind of had to. That was tough country to settle back in the day. I mean, that sort of filtered out uh, Oh man, I, all but the most uh, determined th- I guess this is uh, – that, th- that's an argument for historians to fight over. Um, <laughs> yeah. Why? Yeah. You know, the why there. Because uh, I don't, it it definitely didn't have to go down that way. I don't, I don't no. feel like there's something, there's no like environmental determinism about the way that Texas is that that makes it turn out that way. Yeah. In a lot of ways, Texas uh, climatically is like New Mexico, but New Mexico has a legacy of public land of people working together, hmm. um, and in a lot of ways, uh, Colorado has that same ethos as well. This willingness to come together to figure stuff out to think about our common prosperity. There's a lot of examples to the contrary across the West where that's just not followed out at all. But I will say that for me and my family, we feel safer in the face of climate change to be in Colorado. (laughs) Even though we're largely a desert here, we have way less arable land. um, It's because there is this value of we can come together and we can figure this out and we can think about the long term. And I think people value their lands, their environment differently in Colorado than they do in Texas. And... um, I just think for the long term, this is actually a much safer place to be, even though our even though our growing season is 50 days here or whatever. Well, I yeah. am going to say that I do believe that kind of community ethic is spreading all over the place. Yeah. Maybe um, with less effectiveness some in some corners of the world than others, but I, 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 I'm convinced that the, uh, the direction that society as a whole is heading in yeah. is toward this kind of cooperation. But you've provided a perfect segue because we want to leave right, Texas let's use now. It. <laughs> we're gonna we're gonna move north to Colorado and talk about cheatgrass. Yeah. This is something that you've become very interested in. Mm-hmm. Why? I mean, it's a long, long way from Sweeney, Texas to the sage grouse inhabited s- sage steppes of Colorado. Yeah. What was it that captured your imagination about this issue? Um, I've always cared about grasses a bit because my um, a lot of my family lives in south central Kansas and they're wheat farmers and they're cattle ranchers. Mm-hmm. And I grew up with my, um, my great uncles, my grandfather, my cousins pointing out to me the different grasses on the prairie out there. Um, you know, this is the buffalo grass. This grass was planted... Um, by the CCC during the Great Depression. Um, mm. This was, we know that this land was broken out and it probably shouldn't have been because it has these grasses growing because they were introduced at this point. And that kind of um, vacant landscape, that undulating, uh, mm-hmm. sort of visually boring or subtle landscape oh, out well, there, um, yeah. I actually really like our sagebrush country for the same reason. Um, it I, for me, it I feel like my mind can wander when I see these big open landscapes. Mm. Um, so, so that's the American West for you. Yeah, yeah. Um, so I, I, I guess that's part of the reason why I've been interested in this stuff. I'm also generally a plant nerd. Um, I'm, I'm the kind of guy who gets nauseous on a road trip because I'm like looking out the window yeah. every five seconds, <laughs> identifying stuff growing. at sixty miles an hour. Uh-huh. Yeah, um, but. Cheatgrass is is really interesting. Um, I guess when I arrived in the Gunnison Valley to start my master's in environmental management program here at Western, um, I knew that I didn't want to come in with kind of crazy ideas for what I wanted to do for with my master's project. I didn't want to um, come up with something that people didn't need. My approach was I'm going to just keep my eyes open to what opportunities there are to do good work. And um, I was also fresh out of working for daily newspapers for two years. And um, luckily enough, I got a call from Dr. Jessica Young, a professor here at Western, um, 
and she basically said, Sam, I have a story for you. And it was the story of cheatgrass here in the valley. And give us the uh, elevator pitch version of that story. What is the story of cheatgrass? Um, do you want me to talk about the the West well, just or our valley? St- talk they talk are... about, to begin with, what cheatgrass is. Yeah. I mean, a lot of people, those words don't mean anything. What is cheatgrass, and why is it um, a problem that needs attention? And why is it impacting a wide swath of different stakeholders and interests across the West? And I did say elevator pitch. Okay. So this is your challenge. This is the short one. Okay. Listen, I know you're a journalist. (laughs) I'm your editor, and I'm saying you've got 300 words. Go. Um, Cheatgrass is an annual invasive grass that has radically changed our Western landscapes. Um, It has changed in in large part um, degraded the agricultural productivity of our lands. Um, It has dramatically increase the danger of wildfires and it um, is the main threat to our sagebrush landscapes in the west and to all the animals that depend on those sagebrush landscapes very well done all right excellent so now let's unpack some of that where'd it come from it's a eurasian species um uh, a really fun fact is that its latin name is bromus tectorum which translates to a brome of the roof. Uh, We have a lot of brome grasses. uh, Most of them are introduced out here. Uh, Cheatgrass is a really interesting one. Um, Brome of the roof makes a lot of sense once you start to understand how this grass lives, uh, kind of what its goals are. Um, Cheatgrass has been found in thatched roofs um, Mm. in Europe Uh and Asia. It actually really likes that thatch to the extent that it makes its own. Um, It grows... once it gets well established, it grows these dense mats of really fine stalks that cure out. They become tinder dry um, early in the summer. And so they're available as a fuel source to wildfires for most of the year. And once that stuff gets going, it's like gasoline. Um, if you, you know, look into kind of Nevada wildfires, uh, they have now routinely, they'll have like 400,000 acre wildfires out there. And these are wildfires fueled by cheatgrass, just, I mean, taking up 50 mile by 50 mile chunks of the state at a time. Mm. I mean, you look at them, they, it looks like a bomb went off. Um, and so cheatgrass really likes fire. It makes this thatch, it, it seeds really like to germinate in its own thatch. Mm -hmm. And it, by creating that fuel source, um, burns up all the other competing vegetation like sagebrush when it catches on fire. Then, because it puts down so many seeds, it is the dominant force that comes back after a fire. It outcompetes everything as soon as the rain comes mm-hmm. in the fall. Mm-hmm. And so after a fire, so let's say before the fire, you might have had sagebrush with some cheatgrass in there. After the fire, you have nothing but cheatgrass, just a sea. It kind of, it's like amber waves of grain, um, except in the... Um, in the early summer, it actually turns purple. So it's <laughs> yeah. purple waves of... Yeah, um, you can see that on the on the Mesa hillsides all around uh, where we live. Yeah. Um, and so now it's waiting to burn again. Yeah. Uh, and, and it's not just burning empty ground. It's burning the wildland urban interface of a lot of communities. It's, mm-hmm. it's posing a threat. H- how does it impact agriculture specifically? This is a really tricky question. And it depends on who you ask. Mm. Um, (laughs) um, If we look back in time to um, even the late 1800s, there was a lot of cheatgrass, um, especially out in the Great Basin, places like um, eastern Washington, eastern Oregon, um, southern Idaho, um, the entire state of Nevada, eastern California. So this is not a new development. This is not a new development. Cheatgrass has been around for a very long time. Basically, for as long as we have had cattle grazing in the West, we have had cheatgrass out here. And um, this sort of makes sense. Cheatgrass is from that same part, kind of middle of Eurasia out there where we domesticated uh-huh. our sheep, our goats. Uh-huh. It's in, it's it's just followed them, really. Um <laughs> it's 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 just kind of part of this culture of, of grazing. They're that we a family. Have. They're a family. Yeah, they <laughs> grew up together in, a, in an evolutionary sense. Um, so it's been out here for a long time. In the 1800s and, I mean, continuing into the 1900s, um, grazers 
and drought, and it, which, which one was more important, depends on who you ask, depleted a lot of the perennial grasses in our sagebrush country. And mm. that led to basically a lot of empty spaces between our big sagebrush plants out there. You had a lot of just bare ground out there and our cheatgrass, which can colonize that kind of thing. It doesn't even really need a disturbance to get going. Um, it's just very well adapted. Yeah. It grows its roots faster than anything else. It's able to um, photosynthesize faster. It's just way more competitive than our perennial grasses. You know, forgive me, but it sounds like you admire this stuff a lot. You have to give a lot of respect to cheatgrass. <laughs> and to go back to the agricultural kind yeah. of productivity part of this, um, cheatgrass was a godsend for a lot of ranchers out there in the Great Basin. Mm. Um, they would go through the winter and they would run out of the hay that they'd put up last summer and their cows would be bawling out there because they were half starving in the spring. And, you know, all of a sudden they started to see these shoots of green grass coming up on the bare dirt out there and their cows were able to survive. Their families were able to survive another year because of cheatgrass. So it is decent forage? Initially, when it's when it's green and, and first coming up, that mm -hmm. window when it's really good forage is very brief. Cheatgrass comes up, it grows really fast, it's green for just a very short amount of time. Mm. And then it goes to seed and it becomes this fine fuel, this kind of like gasoline-like thing on the ground that we were talking about before. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, so it is actually really good forage. Its seeds have really high protein content. There are plenty of cows out in Nevada and elsewhere in the Great Basin that really eat nothing but cheatgrass. Mm. And so, you know, if you asked a lot of cattlemen, they'd say that this plant saved them in, in a, a big way. Um, but yeah, there's some big, some big butts there. It's also doing what? Well, it's, it's increasing. It's basically leading to the destruction of our native grasses and forbs in the Great Basin, especially our sagebrush lands. We're just seeing them, um, mm -hmm. go away because of cheatgrass. It's really increased the fire danger in a lot of places like around Boise, Idaho mm -hmm. and all across Nevada. Um, it's definitely encouraging a lot of environmental degradation from that point of view. From the rancher's point of view, it's also a really tricky plant because unlike perennial grasses that will produce some forage, even if you have a dry year, um, cheatgrass, it'll virtually disappear from the landscape if you have dry months during its growing season. It mm -hmm. simply won't germinate, or if it does come up, it'll just be a little one inch tall plant that a cow can barely get a bite of. So it's got a really erratic um, forage production. So it's, it's really risky for- It's not reliable. It's not reliable. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, well, and based on some of the things that I've read, the, the survival of cheatgrass and the survival of some species that are already threatened or endangered is tied lockstep, hand in hand. Is that right. true? That as cheatgrass goes, for instance, the Gunnison sagegrouse goes, already on the threatened um, list under the en Endangered Species Act, is it that clear cut in your mind based on what you've learned? I think for uh, the the Great Basin in general, so we're talking about greater sage grouse, mm -hmm. I think it's a little more complicated than uh, sort of a zero sum game between mm -hmm. sage grouse and cheatgrass. I do think, however, in the Gunnison Valley, where we have really the last viable habitat for the Gunnison sage grouse. Um, it's found, yeah, it's found elsewhere outside of the Gunnison Valley, but, but not it's, in any it's large for, numbers. It's not in any large numbers. Um, we have something like 87% of the entire population of Gunnison sage grouse here. Mm -hmm. I think it is true in this valley, and pretty much every land manager I've talked to agrees with this that if cheatgrass wins the Gunnison Valley, we will lose the Gunnison sage grouse. It's, it is pretty simple in that point. And, uh, I, that was something that I learned talking to Jessica Young right off the bat, and then that was uh, corroborated talking to other scientists that I've met, that fact um, right off the bat. And so um, as a journalist, I just got all the tingly feelings <laughs> that this is this is an incredible story. Mm -hmm. And there I'm are real winners and losers here. The, the stakes are high. The yeah. stakes are high. And um and yet the, uh, the challenge of what to do about it yeah. is enormous. Yeah, and it, it's, it's been interesting to me that this group of land managers reached out to me rather than some uh, hotshot scientist, because I'm, I'm not really a scientist. Um, I'm someone who likes to 
write and talk about science. You're a plant geek. You already I, I'm already, okay, I'm a plant geek. Um, but they've reached, these land managers in our valley have reached a consensus that this is a story that needs to be told. We could go out and rather than uh, putting resources into me doing this storytelling work about cheatgrass in our valley, they could, we could go out and say, buy a bunch of herbicides, buy a whole bunch of seeds and try to go and spray and reseed our way out of this problem. But they've reached this realization that this story needs to get out in order for action to be taken on a scale that would actually be effective. Mm. <laughs> so, so here I am. Here you are. You're the storyteller. Yeah. Yeah. We've tried to come up with a, another word for that, but it's, that's the one that seems to stick. I find that fascinating because, you know, a, a criticism of the scientific community, no matter what problem they're looking at, what area of research they're devoted to, is that they don't always really know how to tell the story in a way that right. most people can understand it. Right. What do you think is necessary in order to change that? What are the elements of good storytelling when it comes to to communicating complex ideas like these? I think what's really key is to make this a human story. And this story of cheatgrass in the Gunnison Valley and across cheatgrass across the West is just full of, of human stories. Okay, so we're out of time, but I want to end by asking you for an example. What's a sample human story related to cheatgrass that you would share? Um, I, I won't name names, but with regards to cheatgrass in the Gunnison Basin, a group of BLM scientists raised the alarm about cheatgrass about 20 years ago. And outside experts came in and refuted their claims that cheatgrass was a problem here. They repeated the same line that's been repeated about cheatgrass for a long time in this valley, which is that it's just too cold here for cheatgrass to do well. <laughs> um, so the outside experts came in. They refuted the claims that this was a problem. And um, that was a really bitter thing for a lot of the scientists who work on this. And now we're at a point where we know they were right, mm -hmm. and we have you know we, we we have lots of information to back that up. Mm -hmm. um, so I'm hoping to explore that a little bit more. But I think also just drawing parallels between how cheatgrass has affected places like Nevada and how it could affect our valley um, will be really effective. And your valley, wherever you may be, because this is not just limited to one particular place. Um, Sam, thanks for sharing your insights. Thanks for having me, Coming Alan. all the way from Texas to Colorado, <laughs> from oil to cheatgrass. Yeah. Uh, I look forward to reading your stories thanks. that, that are, are produced around this issue. Thanks. Thanks for watching. Join us next week for another great conversation on Think Radio Presents Think Planet.